Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Aaron McKeown, musician, writer, and producer, and um, FMC board member. And um, I can't think of a better segue to get to our last panel of the day than Nicole Atkins' uh, video that you just saw. And um, we have our, uh, our our next panel is entirely, as we say, in the ceiling. And um, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce it while we get them up on the we get them up on the board here. Um, in conversation, Meryl Garbus, Tawin. Chris Walla and Jordan Curlin. In today's social media world, musicians are much more than entertainers. They are activists, educators, and providers of news and information. From disaster relief to election work, building awareness for issues and engaging in philanthropy, artists are redefining what it means to communicate with an audience. Our panel looks back on this election cycle, what excites and concerns them about their activism, and reflects on what it means to be an artist and a citizen. Uh, so with us, eventually, will be um, Meryl Garbus, known as Toon Yards, Jordan Curlin, musician manager, uh, musician manager at Zeitgeist, artist management, Tao Nguyen, Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down, and um, Chris Walla, musician and producer from Death Cab for Cutie. And this is a moderated, interviewed, uh, our folks are uh, being talked to by Aaron Potts, the executive director at Air Traffic Control. Hi, Aaron. Can you hear us? I think I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can hear you, and now we can see all of you. Awesome. Yay. Hi. We can't Hello. see you, so we have no clue <laughs> what you're wearing today. <laughs> um, uh, nothing uh, quite as nice as you all. So uh, <laughs> we'll turn it over to you. Thanks. All right. Well, I should acknowledge this is a little bit of a funky sort of setup, but we're down for it. Um, <laughs> We have the five of us here, and we also have an audience of five <laughs> on the other side of the camera that you can't see. Oh, six. Somebody just walked in. Um, and we are all in San Francisco. The Bay Bridge is right outside of our window. Um, let's just maybe introduce ourselves quickly. I'm Aaron Potts with Air Traffic Control. I'm Meryl Garbus, Tune Yards. I'm Jordan Kerland. I run a company here in San Francisco called Zeitgeist Artist Management. My name's Chris Walla. I play in a band called Death Cab for Cutie. My name's Tao Nguyen. I have a band named Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down. Awesome. So we are, I guess, supposed to be talking about the power of music and uh, the role of music in activism and philanthropy and politics. Um, that the role of musicians in these things has been very clear. I gather that you just saw a little bit of what Nicole Atkins is doing around Sandy Relief, um, and particularly with her town. Um, many other musicians are doing lots of benefit events. Um, we've seen musicians going and volunteering, bringing food and water up flights of stairs uh, in Queens and Brooklyn. Um, we also have seen it recently with the elections. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, because I think all of us were involved in the elections to some extent. Um, but of note, uh, I think, is that in the last days of the election, when the big guns had to be brought in, it was Bruce and JC that they brought in. You know, it was musicians that were brought in, not other politicians um, or other leaders of any sort. So this, to me, really speaks to the power of music. And you know, when we think historically about um, music um, and, and social change movements like the civil rights movement or the women's rights movements, you can understand the power of music. And I think probably also on a personal level, everybody here has probably been deeply affected by music on a personal level. But there's also a lot of market and academic research that talks to the power of music. Um, and particularly, uh, we're, as I said before, in California and a, a research came out in California a couple years ago that showed that music uh, informs young people's identity more so than music, than religion. That it is a more important way of forming one's identity than, than religion. Um, biologists have found that music activates the part of the brain that governs optimism. And so when we're talking about the very big and serious problems of the world, um, it's always good to have optimism activated. Um, political scientists have also found that musicians can help uh, their fans feel engaged and that their engagement uh, can make a difference. These are the two most important things to actually make change happen. 
And then um, another study found uh, that people uh, registered to vote in 2008 at concerts were more likely to vote than other groups and also were more likely to not have been reached by other organizations. Uh, so musicians have this huge role to play in activating these people. The other thing to point out, um, I think, is that through live audiences, through social media, that musicians have a much bigger audience than most social justice organizations. You know, the Sierra Club has a half million people on an email list, and bands, you know, bigger bands have millions of people on email lists. Um, and, and similarly with social media, if you compare um, social media, I think, I think Obama had 1.5 million on uh, social on Twitter, and you know, um, Usher has 5.5 .5 million. So just to show you the scale of it, so all that is to say, there is a huge, um, there there is a lot of power in being a musician who wants to engage in music, in activism, or philanthropy, or politics. And so I wanted to ask the panelists to just talk briefly about some of the opportunities and challenges that they've seen in their personal experiences with, with music and activism or music and politics. Carol, will you go first? <laughs> sure. Um, this out of the way, so. Well, first I just want to say uh, I'm going to scooch up closer to the mic because <clears throat> we're sort of micless here. Um, you know, this is, it's very new to me that I want to say thank you for those who got me on this panel because this is really new to me to, to um, you know, make social activism an active part of my music life. And I think, um, you know, it, it's been mind-blowing in this past year of, of seeing how much access I have to, to human beings. So, you know, I, I, for a long time, disregarded Facebook and Twitter and I was sort of like, you know, I can't handle that. I can just handle being on tour and essentially running my own business um, and doing the, the, you know, the professional part of being a musician. And then, you know, lo and behold, today I have, I think, 18.8 thousand, a little number called, I might have looked it up just now, 18.8 thousand, <laughs> <laughs> thousand uh, Twitter followers. And, and that's something... Um, I'm laughing at myself too because I don't keep track of that stuff, but all of a sudden other people have brought those things to my attention. So, um, so you know, uh, let's see, when I, in the past couple of years, all of a sudden I've had resources. Not only can I actually make a living with my music, but um, now I'm actually making more than my living in music and I have options um, to, to use, you know, some of my own financial resources, but more importantly, my um, my access to people to raise money for causes that I believe in um, and more importantly to draw attention to the things I believe in so I, I have this band called Tune Yards a lot of Tune Yards music is influenced by African music and um, <clears throat> and you know I guess to me at a certain point um, I I can't I don't feel good unless I don't feel good about my work unless I'm bringing attention to all of uh, what my music is made up of. So if I'm, you know, if I say, oh yeah, I use this yodeling technique from Central Africa, or this Congolese song really, uh, really influenced me, then you know, how how much further do I have to to go to say what's happening in Congo right now? There are huge, huge human rights atrocities happening there, um, genocides happening there that 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 here we don't hear a lot of. So um, so how can I as as a musician uh, you know, can really connect my music and connect my fans with, um, you know, we can call it activism, but really it's just sort of reality, <laughs> uh, the truth of what's actually happening, honesty. And um, I guess I'll just say quickly that, um, you know, something, something that I just experimented with for the election was hosting Twitter forums for my fans, um, many of whom I think are young people, um, many of whom are women, many of whom it turns out are conservative uh, voters and, and asking, you know, both, um, you know, progressive, liberal and conservative voters to have conversations about things that were on their ballots. So that to me was a, um, the first time that I'd really engaged and, and really there were some heated conversations on those, those uh, Twitter forums. Um, 
that apparently hit a lot of people. You know, it's hard to know when you're just tweeting things what's happening, but um, but really a lot of people saw and and perhaps were engaged and perhaps got more information. Or if nothing else, they know that I um, that I care enough about the election to go out and vote. And um, anyway, that was a really fascinating experience. So before, can I just jump in before you go to say that my husband is live fact-checking me. And in fact, um, Obama now has 23.2 million followers on YouTube, on uh, Twitter. Um, but Romney has 1.7, and Biden has 343,000. So, still, the point, take, take Obama out. The point still stands. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Still fact checking. Yeah, I was going to say your Obama number sounded a little low. It's good to know I'm right on the heel of, heels of Joe Biden with my 630 followers. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Biden follows you. Yes, he does. He does. Um, so I am not an artist, um, although I am very interested in learning how to yodel, influenced by Central African. Um, you got it. Yes, That's the next thank panel. you. <laughs> um, but um, you know, as a as a manager, um, you know, it's it's I feel fortunate in that um, you know I myself am very interested in in. Um, you know, activism and, and um, doing what I can to, to um, you know, be involved in causes and, and that I believe in. And I'm fortunate that a number of my clients, including the two sitting to my right, uh, Chris and Tal, are, are, are interested in as well. So a lot of what, you know, happens, you know, on our end, um, you know, whether it's, you know, being contacted by a client saying, hey, we want to, you know, we're feeling very passionate about this and we want to, you know, get involved. What's the, what's the best best way in? Um, or, you know, on the other side, which happens a little bit, you know, less frequently being contacted by an organization saying, hey, we're, you know, we're trying to raise awareness for fracking, in, you know, up, you know, in the state of New York and, and going out to our clients and figuring out who, you know, who might be interested in getting involved on that end. Um, you know, a lot of our job at that point is to figure out, help our clients figure out the best, most effective way of, of, of doing their part. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it's exciting because obviously, <clears throat> even though I do have that overwhelming number of Twitter followers, um, my clients tend to have a much larger soapbox, much taller soapbox to stand on um, than I do. And, um, you know, we have been, you know, uh, Death Cab for Kenya in particular has been very, very active over the last three um, presidential elections. And, um, you know, it could be anything from, you know, working with, you know, headcount or other organizations to do voter registration at, at shows, which, as Aaron pointed out, can be very, very effective, a very effective way to, you know, helping you know, in whatever way we can with Chris's efforts to actually go out and knock on doors in, in swing states and be, you know, um, involved on a much, on a much more, more, more direct level. Um, so I don't, you know, I think that, um, you know, fortunately there's a lot, of, a lot of great resources available these days, whether it's air traffic control with Jaron Runs or Future Music Coalition to figure out, you know, I don't know, in the best way in. You know, it saves a lot of time because it's very, very overwhelming to figure out, okay, hey, uh, we want to do something, you know, X client wants to do something to aid, um, you know, victims from from Superstorm Sandy. And, you know, it would obviously be a, a much larger task for us to go out and research and, and figure out what's the best organization, who's doing the most effective work, et cetera, who's not overloaded, et cetera, et cetera. So having resources out there now that weren't really even available, you know, 10 years ago um, has, has made our, our jobs a whole lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, as Jordan pointed out in the last, um, in the last three presidential cycles, uh, my band, Death Cafe Cutie, has been involved sort of at different um, at different velocities and amplitudes in the process of uh, getting progressive candidates elected at you know the state level and then at, uh, with the presidential campaigns but one of the things that we have always 
trying to do um, is uh, get voters registered wherever and whenever we can, uh, and through, you know, primarily through headcount has been really uh, has been really responsive and easy to work with, and has proven to be really effective just in um, uh, getting people registered, sort of wherever we go. And the thing for the thing for me, my big passion in all of this is, um, so I grew up in Seattle in the 90s, and I was, I guess I was 16 the year the grunge broke in Seattle, and in like 1991, and I wasn't really able to even, growing up in Seattle, I wasn't even really able to engage in the scene that was happening in my city, because there was a there was a, a thing on the books called the Teen Dance Ordinance that basically provided the cops of the city of Seattle a wild card to be able to shut down any all-ages show. It was basically an ordinance that was full of unmeetable conditions. If you were meeting one, you were necessarily in violation of another part of the statute. Um, and I was really frustrated as a kid who was just getting into rock and roll that I couldn't even go see these bands that I was seeing on TV and reading about in Rolling Stone in my own community. And so I started going to city council meetings as, um, you know, as the conversation was starting to brew about how to rewrite or repeal the teen dance ordinance. And I, I mean, as a, as a loud 16-year-old, I may have been more harmed than I actually was good at city council meetings. But nonetheless, I got the feeling in doing that, that there was something to it, that there was something to just showing up, just representing myself. And the thing that when when I get to talk to our fans in person or when I'm working on a campaign or going door to door or um, talking with college students on campus about the process of being involved, I talk a lot about representation, about how it is a representative democracy. And so much of it is simply representing yourself, how we are the representation. And um, that's sort of my passion. It's just to try and uh, try and impart that however, however I can, and just to remind people that uh, whatever happens in your city or county or state or, uh, or in your country, it's all at some, in some way or another, it, it is those decisions all get made and those candidates get elected because you say something or do not say something. And sometimes that gets lost, particularly in an era where government seems to be a bad word and public investment or public infrastructure or any public program has sort of taken on this, uh, you know, it's so often said with kind of a sneer and there's, there's, there's so many you know, sort of different versions of tax revolts happening right now. And I just think it's really important to remind people that this is this is our government and these are our tax dollars. And as progressives, we have a stake in how those resources end up getting engaged or used and and what they end up getting engaged and used for. So that's sort of um, I guess that's about where uh, where where I come in. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about just uh, sort of my entrance into into taking a more um, concerted role in, with my activism uh, through my music. And uh, let's see. Well, when I was in college, I I had a different plan, and I I was my goal or my objective was to become um, a social worker of sorts and go into women's advocacy. And then I somehow <laughs> ended up playing music, and then that seemed, to be honest, I wasn't going to make it in uh, in that in that line of work because it was such uh, an emotional toll to take. I think every day because I, I worked at a women's shelter while I was in school, and I just knew that I didn't have the constitution for it. But in the pursuit of music, I I grappled a lot with how <laughs> how self involved. It can become, and um, and I, I, I tried to promise myself that I wouldn't. I would make room, and it it would be you know the things I cared about would be just as important as 
as music or trying to make a living at music and and I've been fortunate enough to do so to, to combine both and I think that that's in no small part to air traffic control and Aaron didn't ask me to say that <laughs> I'll tell you right now I'll say it anywhere to anyone um, and also so that as Jordan s stated the, the resources that air traffic control or the future of music coalition can provide uh, a musician is invaluable and you know and the way that it's applied on, on a really practical level I think is is incredibly helpful to us and an example of that is adding a dollar surcharge to every ticket in every city and every show and so and what we've been able to do in previous tours and what we'll always try to do for um, any tour coming up is that uh, you can and ATC has helped us get in touch with whatever organization aligned with whichever cause we choose in whatever city. And the, those folks come to the show, and then they they go home with that money, or the money that's made in their community stays in that community. And it's an opportunity to meet these folks who, the one of the last tours I, I went on, it was all folks in um, who worked with domestic violence uh, victims, and then and also victims of uh, childhood sexual abuse. So you get these amazing, amazing advocates to come to the show just to say thank you. And that was probably my favorite part of the night was to just meet these people and say thanks and hopefully give them a night off and they can go hang out. They didn't have to like my band or have ever heard of it. It's not should I give them drink tickets, um, whatever <laughs> makes it worth the trip. Um, but anyway, we get to say hi and then we get to let the folks know the, the, people at the show that there's this incredible resource in their community and so that's an example and um, I as far as challenges that I've run into and I think all of us have run into this is the, the age-old question why don't you just play music um, which are people who are disgruntled that you're talking about anything the least bit politically charged or that your tweets or your posts or your shows come with what you believe in and I think, um, well, I have to stifle my first reaction because I don't think it's productive. But I've been thinking about it lately, and I think that, that that's such a that's such an example of of how music will will reach corners that will otherwise be unreachable. So anyone who's upset, it's just uh, an opportunity, I suppose. And if not, then at least you know that there's a sort of a commonality where you never thought there could be one before. <clears throat> that may say something. Um, yes, you may say. Um, and then we're going to take questions so people get ready with some questions. I think that, you know, something that's interesting too, and um, you know, that you touched on it a little bit, Meryl, is Outside of the show experience now, obviously, there is this medium or mediums that musicians have, which is still relatively new, you know, because it used to be come to the show and you might hear, you know, Bruce Springsteen talking from the stage about a cause or, you know, obviously going much further back than that. Um, now with, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Friendster and all that stuff, you get... There is this medium now where you can communicate with your fans not only, you know, directly and you don't have to all be in a room together, but also, um, you know, communicate with them as frequently as like, you want. You know, and I, you know, I, um, you know, I get Russell Simmons tweets and they're often about political stuff, but he tweets about like 40 times a day about meditation, which is great, you know. Um, and you don't have to read it if you don't want, but I mean, how has that changed? I know you're not on any social networks right now, but you have been in the past, yeah. but um, you know, I mean, how has that changed, you know, for you guys, and have, have you figured out a way that you can um, best utilize it to communicate with your fans? We've, we've talked about this a, uh, a fair amount, or I, um, at retreats that we've been on, and, and sort of uh, trying to strike the balance to negotiate how to, to spread whatever word you'd like to spread, but also knowing that you might jeopardize somebody's, uh, dare I say, 
followership or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I like followership. <laughs> followership. Uh -huh. um, Just disciple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got this robe on. And, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, and then what I've, and it's it's silly almost to have to think about it, but I guess this is just the territory. Uh, but I, I think that you know, um, we've discussed this, Aaron and I, in, in a group setting. But um, to give up yourself on a personal level, in in what we're assuming, you know, just as I would follow whoever, because I enjoyed their work. Um, and there's that sort of human connection that you want, and or you follow a comedian because they're funny, right? So they got to be funny sometimes, or else why? Mm -hmm. And and uh, so to to strike that balance between talking about you know innocuous personal things um, and giving that bit of yourself is sort of uh, to trade the. The opportunity for the opportunity and the ability to convey something that uh, that is of more substance for you. So, what does that mean in real life? You um, talk about what, who is it that says you know, they talk about their cat and then they say something political? Yeah, you know, yeah. you have to have that balance. Right? I don't have a cat. What you eat for breakfast? Yeah, what you eat for breakfast. I did have a chicken named Jennifer. <laughs> All right, everyone, follow Tao yeah. on Twitter. I'll let you know that she had a yeah. chicken named Jennifer. We'll find out how she died. <laughs> All right, Aaron, can you hear us? Yeah. It's yep. Bracy. This is um, really strange. Is it as strange for you as it is for us? <laughs> Probably. Potentially. Is well, it potentially? I uh, but I think it's kind of working. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, uh, we will look at the evaluations afterwards and decide if this is a. Uh, Innovation will repeat at FMC 13. Um, I do want to see if we have some questions here uh, in, from the audience. Oh, we got a hand. And uh, you have to guess the voice. We won't identify the speaker. You're going to have to guess who it is. Hi. No, I'm just, um, I actually have a question for Jordan. I'm wondering, it's not a question. It's a request to, for you to talk about the project you did around the election and getting people to That's talk so. about, yes, <laughs> about, uh, about 99 issues. Uh, no, 90, 90 days, 90. 90 days, 90 reasons. Um, 99 cool. was Jay Z. This is yes. the other. 99 thing. problems. Um, JK. Well, I'll be, I'll be very brief. But um, so in August, um, uh, Dave Eggers, the author Dave Eggers, and I had launched a project called 90 Days, 90 Reasons, which was a essentially. Um, fueled largely by a trip I had to Chicago in July where I was talking to Mr. Chris Wall about. That story was going to be so good, too. Oh. Uh. <laughs> OK, so I guess what that means is we'll be back at FMC 13 uh, with a hangout for the end of that story. Does that mean we get to go to the cocktail party now? Uh, I'll take this moment then to cut it before we get back on. Um, we have lovely evaluation forms please, please, please go to the registration table on the way out, fill out a form. Um, it helps us produce awesome events just like this one and others. And also, we take good constructive criticism. We, we take your advice. So please remember to do that. And also, I was going to say thank you to our sponsor, Google, for making the office space in San Francisco available and for Google Hangout. But as we know, this isn't Google's fault. So um, Are we back? Yay! <laughs> So then the Secret oh. Service people went out of the headlock. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we didn't have to wait till. Oh! oh. <laughs> Yay! Okay, we didn't have to wait till 2013 to hear it. Okay, hurry before we lose you again. Okay, cool. So, long, long story longer. Um, we, so, we launched this thing at the beginning of August, and the whole concept was how do we do something that's not going to take people, people of interest, meaning you know, celebrities, musicians, actors, comedians, novelists, etc. How are we going to get? How can we get them to do something fairly quickly? We can get it up online quickly and start getting people to really have a dialogue about the election that we felt like was missing, um, that would be appealing to a younger demographic. And that's what we did. So we launched it. I don't remember the exact date, but um, about two weeks after we came up with the idea. And I remember it being one day out, and we had all these commitments and not a single essay in. And I was like, Dave, we need to push this back. Maybe it should be 75 days. And he said, nope, we've already announced it. We're going to do it. And, um, and uh, one first? of my clients bailed us out.
graciously Ben from Deaf Cab wrote, wrote about marriage equality. Um, and then it, yeah, and then it just started rolling. So we actually pulled out, we ended up posting 110 reasons in 90 days. Um, and uh, it was great. And we got a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, folks interested. We ended up um, posting some on Huffington Post uh, as well. BET.com came to us and ended up posting a lot of them. And, you know, I think, you know, I think that the timing that we, we put it up in August when it wasn't really, the dialogue wasn't quite there, it was really after I feel like the conventions that people really started to engage in the yeah. election. I think it I think it helped maybe jumpstart it a little bit. So and that was it. And it was a lot it was a lot of fun to do. Awesome. And I was really happy when it was over. <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Hi, you can uh, I won't make you guess my voice. This is Rebecca. Gates, and I, um, I just wanted to know if you guys would talk a little bit about um, how you, what makes it work for you to make this work a priority um, in your schedule. I know that we all have uh, good intentions, and um, a lot of people uh, can act on those, and others can't. And if there's sort of some secrets you might share with uh, other musicians in terms of, of how this fits into your schedule, and, and et cetera. Tao, go first. I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think what I do, uh, well, I live in San Francisco and I've been fortunate enough to get involved. At, well, to tell you the truth, I had a year off, so that helped. Um, and so this upcoming uh, album cycle, I'm, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how that will happen, uh, you know, aside from organizing the tours around and routing, routing the tours in the beginning. Uh, in conjunction with ATC has helped a lot. So now um, we can take a day off in DC and in Arizona and in New Orleans and, and try to get organized with folks that we've met through them uh, to do whatever we can. But um, I, I think what's been most important to me is that it's uh, it's the only, it's one of the only things that um, helps me feel like I'm a part of the community. I do prison reform stuff in San Francisco and uh, in the state, in the state prison in Chachilla, and um, the, the group, the people that I've met and worked with, are, are have become a really important part of my life. And so I think that that's a, a privilege that I have. That when I come home, there's this, there's this organization that I am a part of, and it's not necessarily for their benefit; it's for mine. So I think that, you know, how I can make time for it is because um, otherwise I would. I would definitely feel that loss. And I think that our lives are so transient that it is, you know, a true privilege to have something that sort of is a home base. Um, and, you know, luckily it's flexible enough that they, they understand if I have to go away for tour or whatever. But I, when I come home, I can always go see those folks and help out. Yeah, if I can lay on this too. I am. Uh, Right at the point that I was really starting to want to get more politically involved and just sort of engage more with uh, causes and um, just whatever I was thinking about and trying to figure out how to ask questions and how to how to get there and how to commit the time to it. Um, I, there seems to be like a, I mean, I certainly have this this fear of not committing completely. And the sphere of, like, if I'm not all the way in it and I can't get to everything or if I can't meet a cause in, in my case at that time it was, um, it was a PETA I was interested in. And I was, you know, I was not totally, I was feeling a little weird because it's like, well, I'm a vegetarian, but I have a leather belt. Can I, like, can I help the cause or whatever? And it was about that same time that, um, I, Met Billy Bragg at a lunch that was organized in a, at South by Southwest in Austin. This was like 2006, I think. And I, I was, I mean, you know, he's such a kind of a, a, a political musical icon. And I was asking, you know, there were a couple of questions in a row, and mine was one of them that happened about absolution and the absolution of commitment and experience. And the thing that he said changed my life forever. And the quote, his little soundbite was, not everyone can give it the full Bono, which I thought was such an amazing way to sum up that idea that 
if you're concerned and you don't know where to start, it's enough that you're concerned and it's enough that you're aware about it and that you want to move forward and that you're asking questions. And the thing that happens is that like, as you continue to ask questions and as you continue to get the support of whoever is around you, you figure out where you fit in and you figure out how loud you can make your, you find the size of the room with your voice just by speaking up and figuring it out. And so, you know, back to the specific question, there's, there's, um, I have, I mean, I have found myself with a lot of time in the last, uh, since we wrapped up our tour cycle uh, in, when was it, August? September? Yeah, something? End of August. yeah, it's been like three or four months, and I have been largely practically unemployed, and so what better a time for me to, you know, I, I have the luxury to be able to give everything I have to this uh, at the moment through the end of the election season, and then for me moving forward, it's um, digging into Senate rules reform until uh, the next Senate gets sworn in in January. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's sort of no... There's really no right answer. And I love that thing about how not everybody can give it the full bono. So. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Uh, just that, that I have had the there's a wrong way experience. Um, <laughs> I mean, perhaps at this point a lot more than I've had that there's a right way. So, so far, I mean, first of all, ATC, that's, it's such an easy thing, like, you know, to, to sort of set things in motion and not spend a whole lot of time, but then say, yeah, a, a, a dollar a ticket is going to this organization. That's all, I'm not doing anything. That's just happening thanks to ATC. So, um, and I haven't gotten to do that yet. So that there are things that I see in the future that will make things a lot easier. I think that for me also, it's concentrating on two or three, you know, specific issues that I, I sort of want to dedicate my life to. And those things are becoming clear. Um, but I recently had an experience of trying to trying to help a, you know, help a cause uh, in, in a really rushed way on a tour, and it was a disaster. <laughs> I mean, disaster upon disaster, and it didn't have to be a disaster. Had it been something that I was really knowledgeable about, had it been something that, um, that I had spent a couple months really researching and um, had done it in, in a right way, it, you know, it would have been, would have been totally different. But, um, but I think that it's a great question, how do you fit this stuff in, and I think um, you know, one one of the things I came to is like, well, don't try to fit too much in. <laughs> you know, I mean, just just sort of one step at a time, and uh, and that that the answers do, I think, sort of become clearer as we as we go on. Yeah. If I may say something too, because I've been scribbling notes over here. Um, <laughs> you know, the ticketing surcharge, although it is a very simple thing, it is it's it's important, and it's not. You know, what's interesting about that is. Ticketing surcharge originally, when kind of fan club ticketing became a popular thing, it was a way for bands to make a little bit more money. So you could say, okay, well, we're setting the surcharge now as opposed to Ticketmaster. So we could say, we're going to charge an extra dollar, two dollars, and that's going to go to our bottom line. So it actually is a big deal for an artist to say, you know what? You know, whether it's $3,000 or $30,000 from the tour, I'm donating that rather than putting it into, you know, into our profits. So, um, but I also think, too, with, you know, from, from where I sit, even, you know, going back to the 90 Days, 90 Reasons thing, you know, was sort of like, you know, that was a way to navigate, you know, what's the entry point? People are having a hard time figuring out what the entry point about the dialogue, into the dialogue about the election was. And I think it's that way about activism in general. And there are some really simple ways to do it. I mean, you might not think of yourself as an environmentalist, but you know what? You could, on your rider, say, you don't want any bottled water on tour. You just want, you know, you, you know you're going to carry water bottles around and you're going to have, you know, big things of water backstage. Um, you know, it could be visiting... Women soldiers, which you guys have done, you know, doing the USO, USO tour when you're in D.C. It could be going into, you know, uh, children's hospitals when on tour and playing a couple songs for the kids. I think, you know, those are, you know, I don't know. It kind of, it kind of comes in all shapes and sizes and just some random thoughts I was having as I was hearing you guys talk. So we have on ATC's website, we have a lot of these resources. Um, you know, if you want to tour with a... a a lesser ecological impact. We have ten things that you can do, which start as easily as, you know, no water bottles, um, and go all the way down to helping mitigate, helping encourage your fans to use public transit 
um, or carpooling or biking even to get to and from your shows because their their transportation is actually 80 to 90 percent of the carbon emissions on your tour. And we've done with many artists, how included, um, some work around uh, around that with our Go Green um, mobile app. But we have lots of sort of DIY um, tools and strategies that are um, documented on our website. The website is atctower.net. Um, and there's also a lot of information. Right now, I know a lot of people are concerned about Sandy. I know you watched some of the footage um, at the beginning of this um, that Nicole Atkins has been working on. There's a, a blog post about how you can help Sandy um, and lots of issue work uh, that if you're trying to figure out, if you're a musician or managing a musician and trying to figure out what what the entry point is, as Jordan said, that's a good place to start. And then ATC is here. We are a free resource to musicians um, and their managers on any issue. So if you're just thinking about it, trying to figure it out, call us. That's what we're here for. Um, and as, as these folks have said, there are some strategies that can be used. And there's not a single you know, cookie cutter approach that fits for every band. But, um, but there's lots of things to try. So we, we are here to help you try. Well, Were there more questions, Gracie? We're done with questions. It's Lissa. And I just okay. want to thank you all. That was a fantastic session. Uh, even with our hiccups, we were able to capture everything. So thank you all so very much. We appreciate it. And, and Aaron, just to close off, um, like Aaron said, there, there are no cookie cut methods for anything, whether it's artist activism or certainly um, how we navigate as musicians and supporters of musicians in this digital marketplace, uh, as we saw today. So I want to thank everybody in San Francisco, everybody online, everyone here at the New America Foundation and Open Society Institute for some really engaging dialogue. Um, FMC continues to provide this important forum for discussion about issues which are at the intersection of music technology and policy. Uh, issues that impact artists' lives, issues that impact all of our lives. And I just wanted to close on a couple of things. Um, and, a, and a good friend of ours uh, on Facebook just reminded me too how FMC started. We started 12 years ago by musicians, artist advocates, technologists, and legal experts. And 12 years later, we continue to do this work to ensure musicians have a voice have a voice on the issues that affect their livelihood, as we heard today. Our activities are rooted in the real world experiences and ambitions of these working musicians. Uh, and these perspectives are often overlooked and have historically been overlooked in policy debates. But the last 10 years, and certainly this past year, we've seen it. And we certainly commend all of the artist activists that have been part of our extended network and family, along with air traffic control. We're guided by our firm conviction that public policy has real impact on the lives of musicians and fans. And we had a manifesto that we did in 2000. And a lot of the core issues around that remain true today. And I promise you, I'm not going to hold you much more hostage, but I'm just going to capture a few of these. What do we do? We draw together the strongest voices in technology and independent music communities to address issues. The artist is always at its core. The voices of musicians on whose art has built an industry cannot be drowned out. Idealists can no longer be locked into opposing sides of an issue that profoundly affect all of our communities, both as musicians, consumers, and fans, and we all must work together. So thank you again for an awesome summit, and uh, thank you for participating for all the folks online. So we're going to say good night and thank you very much, or good afternoon to all of you online, and then for all of us here at New America Foundation, it's time for a party. So. That said, uh, we have a closing party at Gibson Guitar Showroom. It's sponsored by MailChimp. Uh, so please join us in Chinatown. At the front desk, we have directions for those of you that need to um, know how to get to Gibson Guitar Showroom. The party's hosted by MailChimp. We have Tito's Vodka, Sprinkles Cupcakes, Pop Chips, DC kom Kombucha, Taylor's Gourmet Hand Pies, Vita Water, and Flying Dog Beer. It's all on the house. There's limited capacity, so please head right over because we want to make sure you get in. And then also, most importantly, please fill out an evaluation form. It's very important for us. And also, please consider making a donation to the Future of Music Coalition. Uh, we were so delighted and thrilled that we were able to present this e-summit, this summit to you for free. As you all know, uh, it takes a lot to produce these events, and uh, I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for coming. Uh, but know that this was a free event, thanks to our sponsors, but we really could appreciate uh, a contribution, no contribution is too small. So please donate, futureofmusic.org backslash donate. Okay, thanks everybody.